Hello and welcome to the 213th edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a dig route across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. You know my favorite part about a dig route is? What's that? It's always open. And just like our podcast, we're always open. Always this, open for, uh, yeah, exactly. Always open for business. You know. Well, uh, it's always great to be here. Well, we no, can't get uh, can't really open our doors for business without the third amigo in the second city. A man whose first concert was Green Day. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. Much respect, Josh. Yeah, Much American respect. American Idiot tour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also I was saw... hoping you were going to say Dookie. <laughs> I think my first two concerts were uh, some classic '90s artists, Green Day and Weird Al. Oh, look at you. Coach, yeah. what was your first concert? I think I was in fifth grade, and ironically, it was Garth Brooks. Okay. Mm. It's not too bad. It's not bad. It's a too, really good show. Um, yeah, mine was uh, Bruce Hornsby in the Range um, with Bonnie Raitt. Uh, but that was with my parents. So I guess the first one uh, without my parents was the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh Ooh. And the act that opened for them was the Stone Temple Pilots. Follow up question. Now that, now that, now that, my friend, is a '90s back to back. Follow up question: yeah. Best concert you've ever been to, and most prestigious artist you've ever gotten to see in concert. And I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, best concert I ever went to was getting the privilege to see The Who, my favorite band of all time. While two of the four members are still alive, uh, and. It was their first show after a hiatus, so Roger Daltrey's voice was like 1980s level, which fairly good. You know, he he's not going to hit 60s or 70s level, uh, but 1980s level, he can take that. So that was the best show I've been to. Most prestigious artist, I saw the Queen herself, Aretha Franklin, one time. Okay, well, um, I'll go. My most prestigious is probably Yo-Yo Ma. Ooh, I like that. Um, in Rochester, New York. Um, the best concert I ever went to was a um, a guitarist from Mali named Habib Kwate. Uh, he and his band came to play at the Lebanon Opera House, which is in the next town over from Hanover, where I went to high school. And it was, I mean, enchanting. Like, it was the most magnificent music I had ever heard anywhere in my life. Uh, I've been to three more of his shows since uh, in Madison and in Los Angeles. And he remains the best live act I've ever He hasn't ever played at a honky tonk in Nashville? Uh, Not to my knowledge. Maybe the skirmer horn, though, at the the (laughs) Symphony Center here. (laughs) How about you, Coach? The most, one of the most fun concerts I ever went to was uh, Jay Z's Blueprint Three tour. Um, had a lot of fun at that one. Um, most prestigious, it's got to be a tie between the Rolling Stones and Ray Charles. Ooh, uh, I saw Ray Charles at the Peachtree City Amphitheater, um, like one of his last shows ever. Um, that's amazing it was a really small venue really intimate venue uh that was that was incredible so there you go all right well we are going to get into today's show uh with a quick look back on the season uh and more specifically i just want to talk about sort of putting the season as a whole in the rearview mirror we will do you know, season long awards in our next show. Um, We will have our all legal motion team wrapping up everything after all has been said and done. Uh, But after watching LSU dismantle Clemson in the national title game, the thought that kept going through my head was, you know, where does this team stack up against the greatest teams of all time. And in the moments like, Oh my gosh, they're, they're the greatest team, greatest team, blah, blah, blah. Joe Burrow had the greatest season, had 60 passing touchdowns, 65 total touchdowns. Um, You know, they're so good. They're so good. 
But I was trying to remember, I th- for me, at least, the combination here of narrative, offensive dominance, um, you know, and, and just the momentum that seemed that the team seemed to build in every single game that was just completely unstoppable for all the other teams. This, I believe, is going to go down as one of the most memorable teams of my lifetime. You know, maybe not necessarily the greatest. I was born in 1985. Probably the greatest team of my lifetime is the 2001 Miami Hurricanes. At least that's probably the greatest collection of talent. But this team will go down, in my memory, as one that would go toe-to-toe with you know, the great teams from any era because it felt like they could do almost everything. Yeah, I, I think they could do that against all the teams except the 2001 Miami team. I, I don't think that they are able to accomplish the same things with, with that defense running around. I mean, you had, what was it, 17 first-rounders on that team? I mean, it's something insane. Um, just insane collection of talent. Yeah, something like, like 48 future NFL players. And they coached themselves. That's the scary part. Like, if they had a legitimate coach, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, Now, don't get me wrong. uh, LSU was – they were incredible. They were fun to watch. Uh, Matt, you and I watched probably one of the greatest – they had probably the the greatest of all time uh, video department. I'll, I will say that. Oh, that yeah. I, we, I think I, I do want to circle back to that in a little bit. They, they put out some really nice hype videos. But, um, I mean, you, you just go position by position. Um, I think really one of the few edges the LSU does have over that Miami team is, is at the quarterback position. Um, but, I mean, they have their running backs. They have, you know, they have their wide receivers. Uh, I think – well, it's kind of a push on the wide receivers because you go Andre Johnson for Jamar Chase, and then everything else is a push. I think uh, tight end is tight end. We'll see what Thaddeus Moss does in the NFL, but that's I consider that a push with Jeremy Shockey. I think they have more depth though. Uh, but the defense is the defense is where where where, where Miami gets them, um, where where they just have. I don't know. Ed, Ed, I mean, they, I mean, they had Ed Reed, and so they yeah. had the greatest safety ever. But uh, I there's think, still a chance I think that Ed Reed. Runs circles around Delpit. I'm yeah, sorry. he does, but it, but I, there's still a chance that Stingley is the greatest cornerback we ever see. I I, I still I believe still that. I, I know like he's a freshman in college. I need to stop like asserting these like putting up these giant expectations for him. But he is the best individual cornerback I have seen play college football as a freshman. So you yeah, know well, I, I have very very high expectations. He is Ed, Ed Reed was a human eraser and and i i love stingley to death but uh prime will i think prime will hold on to his uh to his crown of the best uh corner in this game we'll ever see we'll see we'll see but i i, I still i still i still think prime is 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 there and until stingley gets that gold jacket <laughs> we'll see um but i'm not trying to take anything away from lsu um, but that's really lofty company. And just, just the fact that we're having this conversation alone just tells you all you need to know about how special this LSU team was. Uh, Clemson, who everyone thought was, oh, this is going to be the team that knocks them off, finally. Here, here's the team that's going to give them fits. Their defense is not going to be able to handle the speed and tempo of which they play. Wrong. Dave Aranda figured them out. Dave Aranda, who's now Baylor, which we can get into that later too. But um, Dave Aranda had a – I mean, I I just think that it was the best patience I've ever seen in a coach. They just they just kind of diagnosed what they did. They didn't panic, and then they figured them out. And then Clemson couldn't do anything after that. And and I thought I thought LSU had a great plan. I thought they hung in there with it, um, and they just got after Trevor Lawrence and 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 their defense really came to play. A, a defense that had been. I hate, I hate to use the word much maligned because it's such an overused cliche in sports, but I mean, that's kind of the truth of, of kind of how they were. I, I know, I know I threw some shade at them for the SEC championship week uh, saying, well, this, you know, this defense is not, you know, this is their weak point and ended up not being their weak point down the stretch. So uh, they figured some things out. They, they tightened up. They got hot at the right minute at the right moment. 
Josh, what will you remember about this LSU team? Well, just thinking about the game, um, I picked LSU in a route and hats off to Clemson for hanging around for that first quarter and, and towards halftime, but then the better team clearly asserted itself. Um, I'll remember the very first play. I mean, you talk about running a little bit scared and a little bit worried. Clemson's very first play from scrimmage was a trick play. And I kind of looked over at my dad. I'm like, "Uh Oh, <laughs> that doesn't bode well. Um, I will remember some of those really fun passes uh, to Randy Moss's son, who I am very intrigued to see his future um, because we all love Randy Moss and (laughs) it's just a bigger version of his dad. It's pretty cool. Uh, So I'll remember this LSU team. I was trying to think, Matt, about the first part of like their place in history. And I I think going beyond the bcs you you begin to hit a new era a different era and at some point it just kind of breaks down where it's like how do you compare a 1966 team to a 2020 team well you can't because the 2020 team in 2020 rules is going to kill the 1966 team but if you take a time machine and try to have lsu stop like the veer how are they going to stop? So eventually you kind of break down. So I feel like the BCS and the college football playoff is a good kind of uh, these last two eras. So just rewinding it super quick, 1998 Tennessee, LSU's better than them. Would we agree with that one? That's and correct, take a dog. T. Martin, and it would take a T. Martin. That's correct, dog. Uh, dog. The, ni- the 99 Florida State team, that one's intriguing. Florida State molly whopped a lot of people. Peter Warwick. First ever wire to wire champion. Yeah. Sebastian Janikowski. I, I still to this day uh believe that I, I still to this day thought that 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 Peter Warwick performance in the national title game was like the most superhuman feat I'd ever Talk witnessed about most on the field. Disappointing pro career. <laughs> All right. For, number four <laughs> overall draft pick. God, well, he got drafted by the Bengals, so it's not really his fault. <laughs> so no. so we got the ninety nine Knowles as in the mix with They're LSU. You can say that. Um, 2000 Oklahoma. nasty. Yeah. 2000 Oklahoma. They the were birth of Big of, Game Bob. Yeah. They were kind of a trestle ball in disguise. They had a lot of grinded out victories. I don't see them hanging with us. LSU. Suffocating defense, but not enough firepower offensively. Yeah. Uh, we've already talked about. They're just like the 2019 Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah. We've already talked about that 01 Miami Hurricane team. Mm-hmm. So they're in the mix. So we got two teams in the mix. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2002, that is the trestle ball Ohio State team. No. They're, Controversial they're champion. Yeah, they're scrappy, but they probably shouldn't have even won their conference or their uh, their national title game. Uh, they did not for the, the second best Miami team to ever step in the field. And for the record, they did not play Iowa that year, who did go undefeated in the Big Ten as well. So you Ooh. never know how that one would have turned out. I know how that one would have turned yeah. out not well for the Buckeyes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the 2003 Nick Saban LSU team. Didn't they have like two they, losses? Yeah, they, they were no, nice. They had, one, no. they had one loss yeah. at least, but. Yeah, yeah they two. went, they, no, they went 11 and one. Matt Mop, uh, no. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say this, if you're looking at things. They're the make, third best national championship team in LSU fielded. Well, I was gonna say seventeen would have beat him. Yeah, I was gonna say if you want to nitpick something about LSU that year, uh, the SEC West was not what it is this year. Alabama that year went four and nine. Auburn went eight and five. I remember. But, yeah. I remember that year. I was a sophomore in college. Um, Georgia had them on the ropes in Baton Rouge, and Scott they they threw a little screen pass to Skylar Green, uh, and, and and that won the game. Georgia lost to him twice that year. Uh, mm. Actually, uh, once in the once in Atlanta um, in the SEC title game, and then once obviously in Baton Rouge. So you're saying Georgia had a heartbreaking loss? Two of them, <laughs> um, and then beat the holy dog crap out of them uh, in '04 uh, in Athens. Yeah, beat the ever living, sh- you know what, out of them. Well, speaking about 2004, that's the USC team that routed Oklahoma. They were pretty damn good. Yeah, that team was that was they're in the mix. That was a liner yeah. Heisman year. Yeah, yeah so they were in the they, mix. They're, they're, as yep, so, so they're in the they're in the mix. Lots of firepower, 
Uh, defense, I don't think can hang with with Miami. All right. They, so they uh, didn't. I mean, they they still had some guys. They had like Troy Polamalu. They had they had, some, they, had some, they had a nice little defense. I still think Miami's better overall. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but we're saying they're in the mix. So they're in the mix. we can put them in the mix. Like they're, right we're, they're in the mix. I'll All give you right. that. They're in the mix. Um, oh five. You can season. put either. You yeah. can put either Texas or USC in that mix. Yeah. Oh five season. I think the oh five USC team is better. Might yeah. have been. Yeah, Might possibly, quite possibly the best game uh, ever played. I mean, some people say that. Well, we we ride in Texas. I think both. Of, I think both of them. We're going with VY. Okay. Yeah. I think well, both of them uh, well, unfortunately, USC could didn't win it, so that's going to hurt their argument. So we won't take we won't take the runners up, but we'll take Texas. So we, yeah. yeah so we've got a USC team, a Texas team, a Florida State team. And the Miami team in the mix. Uh, 06 Florida team. No. No. Nope. Yeah. The 07 LSU team. Better than the 03, but no. Still no. Okay. The 09 Florida team. I would take them before that took the 06 team. But still no. Still no. Is we that, missing that, that was, wasn't that the Tebow speech year? Like the, the, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Are no. we missing 08? No. Yeah, no, you skipped over 08. Who won Sorry, 08? 08 was Florida. 08 yeah, is Florida. The, okay. the game was 2009. Okay, yeah, yeah, but 08 Florida, yeah. and then yeah, okay. I, I said the I said the date of the game, not the year of the season. That was my my bad. Oh, uh, the the 09 season is Alabama. Damn. Yeah, the first one was Saban. The first one was Saban. No. Okay. Fair enough. All right, 2010, Auburn, Cam Newton. Yeah, take and Cam Nick, Newton. Cam Newton, Nick Fairley. Eh, nah. Not no, quite. Almost there. Not quite. Not, not Closer quite than there. the 09 Bama team. All right. Yeah. So that's 2010. 2011, another Alabama team. They were the one that, that shut out LSU. No. No. Okay. The, the, the 2012 Bama team was better. Well, that's the next one. They're the ones that smoked Notre Dame. I, I give them a chance. That was probably the best Bama team Saban's had. Uh, is a chance in the mix or is it just say they're a nice team they're a chance nice team but but they're just sort of being in the mix and the same group as that cam newton squad fair enough and then 2013 florida state uh, james they're, they're a nice james travis yep. benjamin yep. um but again nice team but not at that level yeah all right so that's the bcs era mm-hmm. okay playoff era 2014 Ohio State. No. Uh, You're not riding the fourth string quarterback? I, I'm not riding a, a, a loss to Virginia Tech. Fair enough. But if you want to talk about a team that routed people in the same way LSU did. They're probably um, more in the mix. Uh, I, I'm inclined. They were, talent, they were talented as all hell. Like going uh, back I, mean, I mean, they beat Kent State by 66. They beat Cincinnati. That might have been Urban really Meyer's bad. best team ever. Um, they destroyed Maryland. I think it, I th- I, 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 I think it was. That might have been um, Urban Meyer's best team ever. I, I mean, they they uh, they put up if, 49 on a good Michigan State team. They, it, it, if we're putting 09 Florida in the mix, I, I would replace 09 Florida with 14 Ohio State. Well, 09 Florida didn't make the mix. So. Uh, 08 Florida, sorry. So now you got me all confused. What are you doing? Um, they beat Wisconsin in that title game, 59 mm-hmm. nothing. Then they beat Nick Saban with 42 points. Uh, and then I, they beat the hell out of Oregon, didn't they? In the yeah, title 40, game? 42 to 20. Yeah. So, Ohio, I do that was think. an embarrassing a, moment for uh, Jameis Winston in the semifinal. I remember that. I do think Ohio State might be the second best playoff champion which speaks to how some of these champions have been okay let's keep going okay so we, we just have four teams in the mix to recap florida state way back 99 Peter florida Ward. state yeah uh we've got the uh who's it oh wasn't canes. one miami the 01 canes yep that's what oh. i that's what i had 17 first rounders yep. i think 40 yep. of them drafted <laughs> Yeah, then the 04 USC and the 05 Texas. And backups got drafted. Yeah, yeah. So so those are the four. 
Yes. Uh, 2015 was Alabama, 13 and one, but uh, but beat the 14 and 0 Clemson team, 45 4. What do you think, Matt? I I, I think they got to be in the mix. Deshaun Watson. They rolled Deshaun Watson. It's just, it's so hard to separate any of these Bama teams from any of the other ones. And none of them have just ever felt quite, to me, dominant in the same way that these other teams do. Maybe that's the, that's the Bama tax that they have to pay for being part of such a dominant tradition and program. But Calvin Ridley, Derrick Henry. <sighs> Quarterback, if we want to split hairs, quarterback, um, not not exactly the best. Jake Coker, Cooper Bateman, Alec Morris. They, they didn't they didn't need a great quarterback. <laughs> That's true. That's they true. Were, they were nasty. Uh, yeah, they, Cyrus, I'm, I'm gonna Cyrus I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say no. Let's move on to the next year. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, then 2016 would have been 13 and one Clemson. Beating fourteen and zero Alabama thirty five thirty one. I mean again, great great Clemson team. Um, the one that won last year was better. I'll take I'll take last year's Clemson team. All right, so over that we'll we'll, we'll boot the first Clemson. Then you get uh, your heartbreak, Matt or uh, Coach. I'm sorry, Alabama over Georgia in twenty seventeen. Yeah. I'm sorry they didn't win their division. I don't know. Yeah, kind they of. Didn't. No, I, I can't do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. so we'll we'll nix Alabama. I can't take that. Then we got last year's Clemson team. Yeah, I'll take them. Yeah, I'll t- I'll put them in the mix. They are okay. Pretty three deep. first rounders on the D line. All right, so we just ran through it. We got five teams in the mix plus last year's LSU, which means at the absolute worst, they are the sixth best team of this era that dates back to 1998. That is supreme company, and I think if we then did a deep dive on all the stats if we wanted to. I think they're going to hold their own. Uh, historic performance by Joe Burrow, passing the ball, most throwing touchdowns in the history of the sport. Uh, I mean, to me, they're going to hold up. I think they would. I, th- I think I think, I think, think uh, last year's Clemson would have given them fits. I think uh, the O one Canes would have given them fits. But I think I think they I think they slot in about third in that yeah. era. Yeah, I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna take them second or third. Um, oh. They slot in third. It, it's just it's just hard for me to with with yeah. Give, I mean the whole, give, the whole too deep getting drafted. Oh one yeah. oh, oh, oh one Miami and O oh four USC <laughs> are probably are, are the two teams with them in the mix at number one. But you know who knows though, coach? Because we might see. Uh, we might see a lot of these guys go on to be drafted at the next level. So we have to. Of course, are we taking coaching into account? I mean, if we're taking coaching into account, I mean that's part of the team. I mean, L- I think this this LSU coaching staff is is a superior coaching staff to that of that Miami team, which might actually work, which works in the f- favor of the talent argument of Miami. But if you're like, if I was, you know, they were coached by Ed Reed and, and uh, Dorsey anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, t- let's let's run through the coaches real quick then. Okay, uh, Bobby Bowden. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. great staff. Pete Carroll. Yeah. Mac Brown. Yeah, yeah great staff. Mm-hmm. L- Larence, well, you saw him. You saw Larence him. Coker. <laughs> Larry Coker. <laughs> 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 Great recruiter. <laughs> okay, cool. Best recruiter. <laughs> and, and awesome. Then, uh, and then and then Dabo and. In Coach O. Yeah. Uh, if I'm ranking the coaching staffs, uh, Dabo. Uh, I don't think Coach O has a big enough sample size. I think this is unfair to Coach O. Because this conversation in 10 years, if he averages, you know, 10 and a half wins per year over the next decade at LSU, it'll be a no-brainer. He's going to have a rough, he's gonna have a rough yeah. go this year. He's, yeah. He's yeah, we'll say of course he's. Like, I mean, I don't know if his better, arteries yeah. can hold up that long with the amount of Red Bull he consumes. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I hope he's his, so. his own fridge. Stop. It, yeah, bro. but but Matt, the red beans That's and the rice problem. soaks it up. <laughs> so he's actually got clear <laughs> yeah, arteries. Gumbo, go Tigers! <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Two, wrong, two wrongs make a right. Okay, Matt. 
Well, speaking of coaching, rules, but yeah. speaking of coaching Matt, staff, it, Matt, it's why when you put a shot into a beer, you can't get drunk. The alcohols counteract. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> um, <laughs> while I go do a couple car bombs, um, <laughs> let's think about this. Sake bombs. Coaching staffs. Uh, this year's LSU squad had uh, a phenomenal collection of assistant coaches. And coordinator, and a thirty-year-old passing game coordinator that just signed on in the NFL to become the offensive coordinator for the Carolina Panthers under Matt Rule, who mm-hmm. who uh, whose best article of clothing is a dental smock. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if the NFL, I wonder if Nike makes those for the NFL team, uh, or just or just second-rate Big Twelve teams. Coach, well, worlds will collide sorry, with sorry, Matt. Man rules former school hired joe brady's former coaching staff mate dave aranda yeah, to become the next head bear in charge this brings shit. to a head two uh two forces which were i thought um irreconcilable two, in my mind two worldwide rival nations my absolute disdain for the entirety of Baylor University and my un uh you know unbridled uh uh intrigue and admiration of Dave Aranda. <sighs> this is gonna be hard for me to reconcile, guys. On the field at least, um maybe Baylor's trying to zig where everyone else is zagging Big 12 offense, offense, offense. You hire the one of these singular defensive minds of his generation. He did shut down Clemson. I mean, he shut down everyone. But he shut down Clemson. That's all that matters. Exactly. So, I mean, schematically, see, I, I just, this was shocking to me. David Rand is a guy from the West Coast. If he was a good staff, it's, it's, it's good. It's good, but it, it just, I, it, it, that particular marriage of I, 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 coach I don't, I don't, and school did not yeah seem i don't, I don't like, see like, the fit it doesn't make sense to me but you know it would have made more sense to me if aranda had gone to washington state yeah it would well, have i think they there's rolovich yeah. though that was a good hire for them i think there's three things working in his favor for, or why he would have taken baylor's job okay what first are, of all Baylor he wants to get the NFL. Maybe he saw Matt rule yeah. wants to get the NFL. I don't know. That's not even one that I had considered. What I had considered was Baylor built a brand new stadium recently. They are committed to having a good football team. So they'll give him the resources that he needs. And they have, like I said, a state of the art stadium. So that makes his life a little bit easier than say Martin stadium up at Washington state. Okay. True. 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 Yeah. Texas is easy to recruit. A and M, kind of blah. They just hired Texas, James Coley. Texas, kind of blah, right yeah. now. Yeah. Fair. Texas Tech, always probably, pro- yeah. perpetually blah. Yeah. TCU, kind uh, of. I mean, it's the same as it's been for the last fifteen years under Gary Patterson. You know, yeah. you you know what you're getting. So, I mean, hmm. why can't Baylor keep? what they started under Matt rule. And then that's the third one. Matt rule left a pretty good roster in place. So kind of a turnkey program. If you're looking for one or two seasons of success and then bouncing. I, I wouldn't, that wouldn't shock me. Uh, I, I think if he hires the right staff and he, and he does well recruiting in the state of Texas, he'll be fine. Um, he'll, he'll have a good two, three year run in some bigger program, or maybe some NFL team will come, come calling and and he'll get his big payday. So, um, I mean, for him to to be fair though, he was already getting pretty darn big payday. He was the highest paid assistant coach in all of college football. Yeah. But I, I I think it goes beyond money for him. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think he a wanted to run his own program. Still, I, I, I don't, I don't see the two making sense because of the conference. Because uh, I, I, 
you know, the institution being overly Christian and um, well, they had uh, you know, that, that thing that happened a few years ago. Um, it's just a lot of factors with just Baylor University that didn't make sense to me. But I think Dave Aranda himself, wherever he goes, he'll recruit at a high level. He's a name brand. Um, he'll do well in that state. Um, it's just weird that it's Baylor. But, you know, Matt Rule did well coming from Pennsylvania. So, I mean, you know, and, and he brought Baylor from the ashes. I mean, Matt Rule left Baylor in a better place than he found it, for sure. And, yeah, and I, I think I we think, should celebrate Matt Rule for that. Obviously, we don't cover the NFL too much, and we probably won't talk about him but, <laughs> much uh, if, if things go well. But Well, yeah, I mean, you know, or, in, or in two and a half years yeah. when he uh, <laughs> flames out in the NFL and he's back to being a defensive coordinator at the college level or a head coach at the college level, we'll be talking but, about him again. But, yeah, but, but like, no, he, he's with the Panthers. Yeah, I mean, he he did an incredible job there, and he's leaving the program way better than he found it. So, so Dave Rand is walking into a good situation, good recruiting state. I understand probably what he was, what he may have been looking at when he evaluated the job. Um, so, uh, I will know. I will say this: the tiniest amount of, if we ever were to let. Baylor off of our hate train. The coach has long since been gone. This is true. And Ken Starr's moved on to bigger and better things. <laughs> I mean, true. <laughs> bigger, yes, better. Well. <laughs> well, let's just atten- let's just focus all our attention, all our hate attention onto the phony up in uh, Liberty. Ugh. Oh, I, I'm 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 happy to do that. I'm happy. What to a do freaking that. sleaze ball that guy is! Freezes. Freezes. I mean, which one? <laughs> oh, oh, well, uh, all, <laughs> all of them. Yeah. All of them. The yeah. the entire the administration of the entire university. Well, um, before we can get there, though, a couple things. Uh, Dave Aranda's seat was uh, not open for long in Baton Rouge. Uh, they were able to hire. Former LSU defensive coordinator and now former Youngstown State head coach Bo Pelini back to the state capital of Louisiana. I think LSU fans are pissed about that. Yeah, I would be too. I don't want Bo Pelini. It's going to be some well, weird well, chemistry. Yeah, it's going to be weird. He also I, he doesn't run a scheme that is anything like Aranda's, to the best of my knowledge. I don't think um, he does. I can't remember. He, well, he, it's not, it's not the same blitzing three four that Aranda does, that's for sure. I mostly remember Tommy Armpunt from <laughs> the Nebraska era under Bo Pelini. So, I don't know. I I I, I don't love I don't love that hire. Um, elsewhere, though, um, in the Southeastern Conference, Mike Leach, our favorite pirate, is headed to Mississippi State. I love that. Uh, for any of you listeners that. to the uh, Dan Lebitard show with Stu Gotts, he is Mike Leach has been on the show every single day um, for the past week and will continue to be throughout Super Bowl week, and it is wonderful. Uh, he, I love that hire. I really do. It's. I, I feel like Mike Leach is destined to forever work at the. Uh, the, the the strangest outposts in all the conferences: Lubbock, Pullman, and now Starkville. Stark Vegas, baby. Yeah, and Ooh. his we love we, it so much. We're talking about it for the second time. <laughs> um, I mean, we we should because I think we might have to do our 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 first live show from from Starkville. There I, know, I, I I know some people. I know some people. I, I know the dude who knows the dude disguised <laughs> as another dude. <laughs> well, but I mean, it, we didn't talk about his replacement. Uh, which is where I was going next. Nick Rolovich, yeah. Josh, uh, <laughs> heading from the... The, the benches bench. are a little heavier in Pullman, so he can't. I don't think he can remove him from the sideline. It's a little <laughs> tough to get him out of the stadium. So that'll be, that'll be a tough, tough deal. Because they're uh, like those thermal ones, you know, they're a little bit heavier. So you can't do that. I have no clue what you're referencing at this point, Coach. Do you not remember when Nick Grolovich, 
uh, got so mad at his team in Hawaii that he removed the benches from the sidelines? No, I do not. All right, you can look that up. I think it was Dick Rolovich. Let's see. Let me look that up because now, now I might have just misspoke. You can leave that in there, though. Nick Rolovich. Y'all, y'all talk while I look this up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just leaving this in. I'm, I'm what, 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 in. Matt, what do you want to talk about? The weather? Uh, I want. I want to talk about Nick Rolovich going to yeah, Washington I'll, I'll State. Talk about, I'll talk about Nick Rolovich. Yeah, he had um. Yeah, Nick Rolovich. He uh. He, yeah, Yahoo Sports right here. Okay. Okay. It says Hawaii I, uh... coach removes benches from team sideline in the middle of blowout loss. Yeah. Uh, they were getting blown out by Boise State. They were losing big in the third quarter. Rolovich decided his team didn't need very many places to sit. So he said, okay, bye-bye benches. There you go. And they uh, removed the benches. Yeah, I mean, here's what I think of Nick Rolovich. It's a good continuation of the air raid for Washington State. It's a good uh, way to – the rest of the season yeah. from there to get a bull berth. It's a good way to keep your – what's been working intact. Um, but it's also pinch of a risky hire. 10 wins this year, but overall 28 and 27, 15 and 17 in conference. Doesn't, doesn't play a lot of defense. He's also rather young. So does anyone in that conference play a lot of defense besides Cal Cal Uh, Stanford did at one point. Stanford did once or twice. Oregon's been trying to, they They have been, they keep fiddling with it. They're trying to, Mm -hmm. but no, I, I think, I think it's one of those, it's a lot easier to hire a D coordinator at Washington State than it is yeah. at Hawaii. Yeah, true. I, I think it's a no risk, all upside hire. He either continues the air raid in Washington State, continues to get better at it, and that's their identity. And he goes on to be kind of like Mike Price 2.0 and you know gets them to a Rose Bowl or something. I think that's the ceiling for him. And if it doesn't work out, it you know. It's, You're Washington State. Yeah, it's not that hard to pull the trigger and you fire him after four years. Like, it's not, it's, you know, it's fine. I, I think the promise is there, though. We saw it with how that Hawaii team played these last two years with 18 wins over the last two seasons. So I think the potential's there. Um, but from a, a scheme standpoint, I do like continuing what's working for you. I agree. I think that this is a, a pretty darn good hire. Um, one last uh, coaching transaction we should talk about is uh, San Diego State. Uh, well, should shouldn't talk- we talk about who Hawaii hired? Well, I mean, if you if you want to do that, be my guest. I mean, it's someone that we love on the show and haven't gotten to talk about for a while. Go on. Does anyone want to do the honors, or should I do the honors? I, I'm leaving this one to you, my friend. Do it. The Bluetooth is back. He is. Yes. Sales are through the roof on the islands. <laughs> There's reception again. <laughs> there is plenty of reception. Re- 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 yeah, for, he's uh, he's been out for two years. Yeah, for people new to the show, that's Todd Graham. <laughs> the former head coach of Arizona State. Um, who <laughs> looked like all- he wore a, a trucker Bluetooth headpiece <laughs> instead of an actual headset. <laughs> Yep. It was the dumbest looking thing I've ever seen. There's no way he could have heard anything going on in that earpiece. There's just no way. Yeah. It just it just didn't cover enough of his ear to drown out the sound. Of course, maybe there weren't enough people at the Arizona State games to make noise. So, well, there's that. Maybe too. it was okay. I don't know, but it was I, the stupidest looking thing I've ever seen, and there's no way it was functional. I kind of like this hire too. Um, I, I don't actually good, hate it either. He's a good he, coach. Uh, I don't, I don't want to admit that. He's a, he's a, I don't mind admitting. Let's, let's let's talk about the risks. He wasn't a, he wasn't a good fit at Arizona State. Yeah, let's talk about the risks. He and left he Rice. Right. He left Rice after one year. Then had four good years at Tulsa. Then went to Pittsburgh for one year. So if he hits it out of the park, he's bolted. True, but. If he, he hits have, out of the park, that's not the end of the world for no, that's not the end of the world for a while. But he did have two 10 win seasons at Arizona State, took them to uh, five bowl games in his six seasons, which is nothing to scoff at. Took god awful Tulsa. Where's that Tulsa program been since? He won 10 games, 11 games, five games, 10 games at Tulsa. 
three bowl games in four years. Like he's a not a bad coach, and Tulsa is a hard place to win. Hawaii's also a hard place to win, so he knows how to do it. Could be a great fit. We'll see, but I I, I do kind of like it, Coach. I love it. I mean, I, I think he's you know even though he's been places for a short amount of time, I think he's done a good job. I think he's I think he's a good coach. I think just the knock on him is that he's a He's a freaking uh, blows with the western wind and um, wears a goofy headset. But otherwise, I, I think he's pretty good. I, I think he got kind of a raw deal at, at Arizona State, even though Arizona State's fine now with with Herm Edwards. I think they've stabilized. Are but they fine? I mean, for I mean, they're Arizona State. I mean, what do you expect? They're not. They're I think they're uh, a freaking Pac-12 powerhouse. But I mean, yeah, better than. They're, they're overachieving, I think, a little bit. So, um, but who, who knows what he would have done had he been given more time? I don't, I don't know. Arizona State's just a tough place to – Some it, it can be a tough place because you're, you're right there. Like, Arizona's not packed with talent. Um, most of your in-state talent goes right across over into, like, USC, UCLA. Uh, you know, then you got your Texas schools that come over and, and – and poach into Arizona. Then you got Colorado coming down. I mean, and when you're not a strong program, it's easier to pull, it's easier to get recruits plucked right right up from under your nose. And and maybe that's something that Todd Graham needed to work on, and maybe that's something he needed to realize. So now he's going to take a step back at Hawaii. He's going to kind of collect himself, figure out a nice recruiting plan, try to do the best he can. That's a tough place to recruit. Hawaii, uh, ironically, it is. Um, but he, he'll kind of – I think he'll kind of get his, you know, stuff together in that regard. And I think the next P5 job he gets will be uh, – I, I think he'll do really well at. I, I will say this about Todd Graham, just to put it in some context for people that don't know much about ASU football. But uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they had an absolute legend who coached there, Frank Cush. He was there for 22 seasons, 764 win percentage. Uh, since then, Todd Graham is the second longest tenured coach at six seasons. That's second only to Bruce Snyder with nine. And he's got the he's got the third highest winning percentage since Frank Cush. Um, the the people ahead of him are John Cooper, who went on to do great things at Ohio State, uh, but he was only there for three seasons. And then uh, Daryl Rogers was there for five seasons in the early 80s so Todd Graham's 590 far and away better than the other people who've been around him but um yeah he he did good things at Arizona State I think you're right go to the end of raw deal yeah he did he did um well uh let's head from uh Arizona to uh San Diego State who hired Brady Hoke uh, to replace Rocky Long, who stepped down and is now the defensive coordinator at New Mexico, uh, following in the footsteps of uh, to be an assistant for a coach who was formerly an assistant to him. And yeah. if that's not confusing at all. Well, let's unpack it. So Rocky Long used to coach at New Mexico. That is correct. Had on one of his last few teams there. Danny Gonzalez, and then he goes to SDSU, and Gonzalez joins his staff and has been his defensive coordinator. And then Gonzalez gets his first head coaching job. And so, I don't know. I, I think Rocky Long's kind of doing the fatherly thing, and um, Rocky Long also obviously has ties to the New Mexico program. I don't know what else he could have done at SDSU. He's also up there in age. He's one of the older coaches. So he gets to step back from doing the head coaching duties. So it sort of makes sense. You do have to feel bad for SDSU, though, in that they probably were not expecting to have to hire a coach. But they get Brady Hoke, who used to coach there. But um, – I don't know. What else is the reason he got the job? Because here's his time since Michigan, which went disastrously. One season at Oregon before they ran him out of town 
with pitchforks and burning torches. Uh, Tennessee, for one year, he ended that year as the interim head coach, which can tell you how that season went. Oh, yeah. One year with the Carolina Panthers, defensive line. And last year, he was on Rocky Longstaff at San Diego State as the defensive line coach. So it hasn't been exactly the most glorious few years. Also left out of that, he was fired from Michigan in 2014. He got that Oregon job in 2016. So he spent two years in the booth also. Yeah, it's pretty uninspiring. <laughs> yeah, pretty weird. It, it definitely does not fit. Um, well, uh, before we go, I just want to talk quickly, guys, uh, about the transfer portal. It's, uh, it is that time of year where, uh, players who are, uh, for one reason or another, wanting to leave their current situation, uh, to head to greener pastures, closer to home, uh, change of scenery, et cetera, uh, are doing so. Uh, the transfer portal is open. Um, which means mostly quarterbacks, but also players from other positions are uh, going to be taking their talents to other parts of the country. Uh, Coach, I'm going to give you first uh, a list of quarterbacks who are changing schools and uh, want to know your thoughts. Um, Felipe Franks going from Florida to Arkansas, Justin Rogers, TCU to UNLV, Phil Jerkovich, Notre Dame to Boston College, Jake Bentley from South Carolina to Utah, De'Aaron King from Houston to Miami, and Nick Starkle from Arkansas to San Jose State. Which one of those do you think is going to have the most impact for next season? De'Aaron King, for sure. Um, I, I think Miami's offense just needs a little spark. Miami just needs something positive. They had a rough go, Manny Diaz's first year. Um, that's just being kind. So I think they get a playmaker like De'Aaron King. I, I think it's going to, uh, I think it's going to uh, do wonders for their program. They just need a spark. They just need something popular. They just need something exciting. Um, he, you know, I, I don't think they're going to be in playoff contention with dear King, but um, I, I do think it'll help recruiting. I do think it'll help turn things in the right direction for Manny Diaz. Um, and it does help dear King um, as well. Uh, I think also uh, Jake Bentley is interesting going from South Carolina to Utah. Um, not sure, not sure. Uh, where that came from, but Jake Bentley was was a was a pretty good quarterback for South Carolina, a thorn in the side for a lot of a lot of the SEC East uh, opponents that he faced. So uh, that's one of those things that we'll kind of see how he does under Whittingham. Uh, Jerkovic, uh, I think BC's getting a good one there. Um, I, I think he'll do well, uh, in, in, especially in the ACC. I think he'll light it up. Uh, Felipe Franks, a new start. He'll be kind of more of a. Uh, I, I, I don't think he's in a high pressure situation like he was in Florida. I don't think Arkansas fans are going to look down on him the way Gator fans did. And I think they, I think they'll be more appreciative, which will take a lot of the pressure off Franks um, being out of that, uh, being out of the swamp. So I, I think he's, I think he's landed himself in a better situation personally for him, uh, for his nerves. Um, I think you'll have a more successful season. Now, whether that translates into wins for Arkansas, there's such a depleted roster right now that I don't think they're ready to, you know, win a whole bunch of games, but I, I think that he will do better statistically and he'll have a much, much easier go. Um, one that still intrigues me uh, is KJ Costello. I think it, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to read the tea leaves on here, but I think Mississippi State would be a great destination for him. I think he would kill it under Mike Leach um, if, uh, if that's a possibility, um, which I think it might be. It's just I don't think – I think it's imminent, but I don't think it's officially official yet. Uh, Joey Gatewood at Kentucky would be uh, – is going to be awesome. I think that's going to be exciting. That's uh, actually the one I wanted to talk about. Coach, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go for it. I'll lead you right yeah. into it. I, yeah. I, I, I like it a lot for Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, y you hit all the ones that I want to talk about, but Joey was actually at the top of my list because yeah, he absolutely. doesn't, he doesn't truly fit the mold of the, the transfer portal of a grad transfer. Who's going to play immediately. He does have to sit out next year, but uh, this was a four-star recruit, pretty high. He's just going to make up some baloney story and they'll give him a waiver. <laughs> Yeah, pretty high pedigree uh, when he went to Auburn. 
goes to Kentucky. Kentucky won a bowl game this year. Uh, do you get, guys know who Kentucky's quarterback was by the end of the season due to injuries? A, 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 Jr. a wide receiver. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, so, were, uh, they were like 98% run. Yeah. So, they were beating people. It was crazy. Yeah. So uh, for, for Stoops to have a kid, again, not playing next year, but the following season for two years of eligibility to build around, that, that's great for his program. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, Non-quarterbacks, uh, some notable guys. Uh, Tariq Black, the wide receiver from Michigan, is headed to Boston College. Martel Petaway, uh, running back from West Virginia to, to MTSU. Cade Mays, uh, offensive guard, headed from Georgia to Tennessee. Uh, Justin Shorter, um, headed to Florida from Penn State, wide receiver. Devin Williams uh, like from uh, USC up to Oregon. And finally, um, uh, coach, any of those guys really sticking out to you who are going to make an impact quickly? Well, the Cade May situation depends on uh, depends on whether O line coach is smart or dumb. Uh, because if their O line coach is dumb, which I hope against Georgia he is, uh, and they put him at tackle, whoever's wh- whatever poor soul is back there, quarterbacks gonna get killed because Cade Mays is not a tackle. Uh, and this is not me talking as a bitter Georgia fan that one of our five-star offensive linemen left and yada, yada, yada. Oh, you're just sour grapes. No, he's a guard. He's a great guard. I love him at guard. Hate to see him go. Um, but you could see if you watch the Sugar Bowl, it's plain as day. He's too slow to play tackle. He, he's a perfect guard. He's a great, great puller, great zone blocker, great interior guy. Nothing wrong with that. The world needs the, – the NFL, the, uh, the football world needs good interior linemen. And Cade Mays is that, um, you know, I think that the, the number one reason that he just wanted to play with his brother, uh, they just wanted to keep the family together. And I think his dad was mad at two things that Georgia didn't offer his younger brother and that uh, Georgia was uh, denying his shot at tackle when Kirby Smart put him on the tackle pedestal in the bowl game and he got exposed big time. So um, he, he's, he's a, he's a vol now. So, uh, we'll see how he does. That's interesting to me. Um, and then before I cede the floor to to, uh, to Josh, I really uh, I really like the Justin Shorter pickup for Florida. Um, if I'm a Florida fan, as a Georgia fan, I, I I don't like it. He'll be a dynamic receiver for Kyle Trask. You'll hear his name a lot. Um, he'll I think he'll have a similar impact that Lawrence Cager had for Georgia. Unfortunately, um, but. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we'll see how he uh, meanders through that SEC schedule. So uh, that's interesting for me. Um, and, and I really, really uh, those are the two that really stood out to me for the position guys. Josh. Yeah. I, I didn't know if Matt wanted to jump back in. No, but... I was waiting for you. Yeah. This is your cue. Well, uh, I've got some off the wall ones, uh, just two. Hit it. One that I'm intrigued by. Kicker, Jose Borregales. Uh, incredible career at Florida International. But he's a local Miami kid who always wanted to be a cane. They basically told him to get lost. Goes to FIU, has a phenomenal career. And this year, uh, hit like five field goals in FIU's win over Miami. So Miami decided if they can't beat him, they're just going to sign him. Um, but but can't uh, beat him, sign him. Uh, but Miami also has uh, a hole at kicker, so that's going to be intriguing. As Coach alluded to, Manny Diaz's first season was awful, and now they're getting a really good kicker to try and solidify some things. So I like that. And then the other one I want to talk about uh, had to be a little bit of a homer. But... Oh, J- Josh, 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 mm. are you ready to get Kronk? I am ready to get Kronk. Yeah, Koi Kronk. Yeah, Koi oh, Kronk. Kronk is. In, yeah uh, in um iowa city yeah uh or is it ames he Which one is iowa? <laughs> iowa city there you go Jesus. um if you I'm don't remember for- if you don't remember what he did this year it's because he had a season ending injury four games into the year however prior to that his junior season started all 11 games sophomore season started all 12 games freshman season started all 13 games and that's all at left tackle. And as you know, Tristan Wirfs 
going pro. There's, uh, you know, some other spots on the line. For instance, Alaric Jackson, he's coming back, but he was banged up last year, so don't know his full health. But uh, it's great for Iowa to have a deficiency on the line get fixed immediately by Koi Kronk. Let's get Kronk. Yes, I am ready to get Kronk. All right. Well, on that note, I think it is take time for me to take my Kronkness to bed. <laughs> so, um, can I uh, tell you my dumb cocktail story, real quick? Please. Before uh, you jump into it, um, I got to ask y'all a question. Okay. So, what is the fate, the fate of a man that gets um, that blows a twenty-four point lead in the AFC Championship game? What do you think happens? The only logical thing he gets he gets promoted to general manager. <laughs> yeah. Hey, coach, how do you feel that Bill O'Brien? Coach, how do you feel that there's a prop bet that the last time I saw was a hundred to one odds on Shanahan blowing a twenty-eight to three lead? Oh God, <laughs> it's, it's too soon, Josh. Too soon. Well, it's Josh, if, you, if you're in the uh, Briarcliff area in Iowa, Briarcliff University is looking to hire a full-time defensive line coach. Candidates are. will be responsible for film breakdown using huddle, recruiting your own area, and coaching your own position group and any other duties assigned by the defense coordinator. You must have three years of college coaching experience. It's a full-time salary position with full benefits. I don't know where that town or school is. It's in Iowa. Somewhere. Great. <laughs> so you should apply be great perfect it can get us uh, yeah. some real uh man uh on the streets feel to it yeah. all right anyways all right, all right. so all my right, dumb cocktail d- my dumb cocktail story if you don't care about cocktails and dumb restaurant stories turn the podcast off now uh but a funny thing happened to me for those of you still listening um last <laughs> last weekend um last weekend some family friends of my girlfriend were kind enough to invite us to go out to eat to this restaurant. Uh, I am going to name it because overall it was a net positive Chicago Q. Really good barbecue. I had some fried chicken. That was amazing. Once they got my cocktail right, it worked out. But I'm ordering my cocktail and I'm ordering a martini and ask, do you have Bombay Sapphire? Says yes. I'm like, awesome. I'll have a Bombay Sapphire martini. I want it stirred. And before I can get my next word out, he interrupts me and goes, do you want it up? I'm like, well, yes. Who wants martini on the rocks? Like, that's a pretty rare thing. So he cuts me off. He's like, okay, uh, up. And I was like, yes. Then I was like, I want it garnished with an olive, but not dirty. Because most bartenders, when you ask for an olive, they immediately throw in a bunch of olive juice. He goes, okay. And then I was like, I want the martini wet, which means vermouth in it. He kind of looks at me weird. And I was like, I was like, I want vermouth in my drink. He's like, oh, okay. And then he's like, how much do you want? Do you want like a little splash? And I'm like, no, like I like the vermouth. I was like, when I make it at home, I have a very wet martini. I do like a two to one ratio when I'm, when I'm at home. The normal ratio is three to one. Sometimes you'll find four to one. And so, you know, I tell him, I was like, no, like you can, you can be generous with the vermouth. That's fine. He's like, oh, okay. He leaves. Comes back with a brown drink. I'm like, what the, what the hell did he make? So when he walks out, I, I take the smallest of sips. They put in sweet vermouth. <laughs> Oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> and, every, and everyone at the table was like, what? And uh, the, the, the husband, uh, uh, Chris's family friend, was like, was like, it's made with dry vermouth. Why would they have done sweet? And I was like, I have no idea. So he comes over and I was like, I was like why'd you put sweet vermouth in it? He's like, I asked you if you want sweet vermouth. And I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, I did. And then the, the guy that was treating us to dinner is like, he's like, no, you didn't. And he's like, and besides, no one would ever have that drink. He's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go get it straightened out. He leaves, and we're talking about it. It's like, it, in what universe would anyone want 
gin and sweet vermouth. And if you were the bartender and you get that written down, handed to you, wouldn't a bartender be like, what the hell is this customer ordering? Can you like double check and ask them that? Bartenders see some, I mean, to be fair, bartenders do see some weird stuff, but. But still. not so, who, a sweet vermouth martini? Like there's three cocktails that are the original cocktails. The Manhattan, the martini, and the granddaddy of them all, the one that's literally called the old fashioned. And it's like most people that like those drinks don't mess with the base ingredients. <laughs> like no one puts dry vermouth in a Manhattan. No, they don't. Be disgusting. Just like no one would put. Uh, it was but, yeah. It was baffling. But Chicago Q, they got it right. They didn't charge us for the messed up drink. The fried chicken was delicious. All in all, good experience, but a very bizarre cocktail story that i wanted to share with you guys yeah so uh you're rushing out to buy some sweet vermouth now <laughs> make your maybe you just call it the maybe you just call it the cook <laughs> oh god it, one sip was enough it was disgusting it'll cook up some <laughs> whatever whatever you want to insert there he'll cook up some love for you there you mm. go uh, I think it's, I'm good. The, it's the love potion mm. Maybe that's the name of the drink. It's the love potion because it's it's sweet vermouth <laughs> for wood. Sweet vermouth is a phenomenal ingredient. Not, you mixed, going here. <laughs> not mixed with gin. I mean, we uh, yeah. I mean, God Almighty, that's bad. <laughs> here at Illegal Motion, where we bring you the latest college football and cocktail news. And concert news, apparently. Apparently, yeah. we're the we're, we're, we're the, the, the the three the, the three C's: college football, cocktails, and concerts. It's the off season. That's things not, get, things that's not a, a bad wacky. show. That's not that's not a bad premise for a show. No, I'm not, I'm, like not mad, I'm not mad at it. I like it. Music, cocktails, and, and college football. I mean, mm. throwing movies and that's like my life. Cinema starts with cinema. a C. There you yeah. go. Hey, yeah. cinema and go. cookouts. Cookouts, yeah. cookouts, hey, cookouts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two of us live in the South now, so it's all about the cookouts. I, I, I didn't live. know that we had an Italian accent when we were saying cookouts these days. I live in the but, South, uh, side, side of, of Chicago, South, 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 south of Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, no, I, was, I was doing that for you, Josh. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you can come on out to our cookout. Don't you dare call it a barbecue, you daggum Yankee. Go Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> how about that is that better does that work for you that that i mean that works for me so make you feel more at home it, it makes me feel better there you go well as long as it makes you feel better that's good if it makes you feel happy you know what it can't be josh it can't be sad it can't be that bad no mm. yeah that too mm, it can be bad <laughs> And on that strange note, it is can, definitely time you can, you for you can be coached by guard. for us to end <laughs> our show this evening because it has gone so far off the rails that it is now uh, descending into the darkness. Darkness. <laughs> darkness, everybody. Hey, I'm gonna go, go to it. I don't like the darkness. I turn on the light. I have a nightlight when I go to sleep. I, I don't need a light night, nightlight. I drink so much Red Bull. I just glow. <laughs> I drink so much Red Bull I have to cancel it out with red beans and rice and soaks it all up. <laughs> Go Titus. Uh, on behalf of our own offensive coordinator here in the Music City and our intrepid blogger from Bing Ted and Counting up there in the Windy City, this is the professor in Nashville saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. Jack Gordon, who put a sweet vermouth in my gin? This is not a this is not a cocktail. It's it's Red Bull gin and Red Bulls are right. Go Tigers! Go Tigers! Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail Follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion, and check out our Facebook page.